Sarsky, you mentioned at the last table something al along the lines of, of hopelessness. And we have a tweet uh, that I think we can show full screen that we've had come in on hashtag stay tuned to STL. So at chill season, tell me what emotions ran through you. Last time you felt hopeless, the last time you felt there was no solution. We have it back at the table with Starsky, Starsky, Reverend Tracy Blackman, and Faith Sandler, the Scholarship Foundation. Foundation. Um, your reaction to those, that, that sentiment there? Last time you uh, thought there was no solution. Do you hear that from people? Well, we've heard from our students, from some of the young people who are out there at night on the street, um, is not no solution, but uh, disillusionment with the solution of the adults in their lives and with the systems that they've na tried to navigate through. Like, you told us if we went to school, you told us if we participated, you told us there'd be a place, and there's not a place, and our voice is not being heard. Um, so I, I think that one of the most important lessons that I've heard in this whole thing is to stop and listen to the generation that's going to come along behind us. They're, they've made it clear they've had enough. I almost answered that I haven't felt hopeless. I, 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 um, I've gotten so comfortable with the privilege, right, that I, I, I thought, oh no, but I, actually it was, it was, it was when I was 15 or 16 years old um, when I last felt hopeless, and it was after my brother was shot, um, and, and I didn't really appreciate uh, what it meant to go to school. I was in a magnet school for public service and law, I'd get up four days out of five and get drunk before school. I'd go to school, I'd you know, pass out in first period class sometimes, wake up in the nurse's office. Um, that was the last time I felt that. And so, so I say that to say, it's, it's a powerful question, I appreciate it because there are teenagers out there who will go back to school next week, or those who went back to school on Monday, and Tracy was cheering them on when they came back to Normandy to Mike Brown School, and they're going to be dealing with this reality, and they'll deal with it in different kinds of ways. And I dealt with it by by drinking, and um, and doing so, you know, when I shouldn't have even had access. And because I thought, what's the point? You know, if I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, maybe I make it through high school, but you know, my brother wasn't a bad dude. He wasn't doing bad things. He was hanging with his friends. Um, so, so what's the point, right? What did you do in that situation? Well, you, you presented in a way, I presented in a way that illustrated my trauma. And the reality is we are all traumatized. Any, anyone who saw, it is not natural that someone see um, the innards of a body on the, on, laying on the street. Mm -hmm. And the entire community of Canfield Green saw that. And many of us saw it on social media or saw it on television and we're going to respond to that trauma in some way. Um, and perhaps we will slip into hopelessness because of it. Um, and we have to find ways and communities to, to help us with that. And my, my, my prayer is for young people and, and that they don't respond to that in the sense that I slipped into. What was the difference for you? I went, I, I went to some counseling. Um, there at school, there were resources. Uh, of a social worker and a counselor who I ended up having to go to twice a week um, over the course of that year. Uh, and um, in community, I had a, a small group of uh, young men uh, that spent time with me. Uh, we, were doing, we were in a little community service fraternity and leadership development group. Um, when I got, literally, when I got home to my um, living room for when my mom told me about my brother, they were all in my living room. Uh, and so this group of positive, young African-American men surrounded and supported me. Uh, the church surrounded and supported me. Uh, and I got some good counseling. Um, and, um, and that's going to be required for some young people in this situation and, and, and honestly some adults too. I mean, we've got, we got adults and children who got tear gas last week um, who are civilians. And they're experiencing trauma. And so. Um, those young people are going to require some, some presence, uh, some professional support, uh, and some communities of love and, and encouragement in order to make it through this. I never, 
I think I didn't want to think about that question. Um, I have two black sons. They're 23 and 24, and they still live with me. They're both in school. They get stopped frequently. We live in a neighborhood where they're not expected to live. One has a neat haircut like Starsky, <laughs> and the other one has dreads down his back. Like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, both very brilliant young men. And I've been out in this battle from the beginning almost every day, and my young men have not. And so just a couple of nights ago, they came in late. I came in late. They call every day to say, Mom, are you safe? So I asked my oldest son, I said, why haven't you been out to protest? And he said, because you're protesting the wrong thing. I said, explain. He said, all I hear is you want justice you want this police officer prosecuted. He said, it doesn't matter who the police officer is. It's the system that's oppressing me. And until you ask the right questions and you hold up signs for the right thing, I'm not coming out there because my rage will erupt. I, I... That's a sign that Twitter comment makes me recognize, I've been grieving that. Mm -hmm. I've been grieving that my child feels like that. But I didn't have a name for it. And I think that's also a form of hopelessness, that he feels that no matter what he does, and, and if you're not an African American, I have a daughter who's 27, and we had the conversation about the fact that she got into this big argument with her brothers once because the police pulled them over, all three. And they weren't speeding. The police said, well, there was a car who committed a, that committed a crime and it was silver, and they were in a silver car. My daughter, who is very much like her mother, <laughs> <laughs> went on this rant about, you have no justification to pull us over, and what kind of car was it? And she said her brothers were terrified. And she didn't understand, you know? And then they asked her brothers to get out the car, and she said, don't you move. I'm the big sister. You don't get out of the car. They can't make you get out of the car. And they literally, she saw the tears in their eyes and stopped because they said, you're going to get us killed. That's not even a reality that my daughter has. But and they're in the same house. This is why things can't go back to normal. This is why your comment earlier about some amount of gratitude that we've gotten to this place is because our young people know how the system has failed them. Mm -hmm. It's not, this is not 1960 anymore. These are young people who grew up with a promise thinking that things were gonna be different, but it still matters where you're born, where you live in this town, what your outcomes might be, and that's wrong. It's just plain wrong. So I think young people's rage is not, I mean, certainly to respect the family and the loss in our community of one young man is important. But it's actually, for young people, I think much more about acknowledging where we really are and being truthful about where we really are as a community. On, on Twitter, the, the, the new normal that you all are talking about is getting a lot of traction. It, it, is that possible to have to not go back once the time passes? It, it's possible, but we have to address these systems and we have to put structures in place that help us do it. So I was encouraged by uh, the visit and the conversation and I, and I pray uh, there's massive follow through um, to the words of Attorney General Holder uh, on yesterday. Just about to um, say that. You know, community oriented policing and the supports that can come from the Department of Justice, if they really get to get in here and to assess the way our police departments work uh, throughout the region, uh, really assess the systems and supports and, and structures they have in place, not just for teaching and learning and training officers, but also holding them accountable uh, and bring the weight of the Department of Justice, which can bring suits against 
police departments who have this kind of disproportionate uses of force, uh, disparate um, uh, policing practices that show up. Uh, those things need to happen and as a community. We need to engage them so that we put some of the structures in place. Civilian review boards we need to put in place. There actually need to be penalties for municipalities where we can document this disparate, uh, these disparate stops based upon racial lines. Unless we put those systems in place, then we won't see a new normal. Otherwise, we're just wishing and dreaming. Thank you.